St. George booked its spots in the finals with a plucky win in the final regular season game against the Western Reds. The Dragons had a severe case of the dropsies in the first half before getting its act together in the second half to finish the stronger of the two teams in the 22 points to 16 win at the WACA ground in Perth. At the Wacker ground, while the Reds' farewell club captain Michael Potter in his 200th game, Mark Geyer was in charge of welcoming the Dragons. Geyer inflicted more damage on the Saints, Luke Felch forced off, but with the Reds threatening, Ricky Walford took charge. The Dragons unable to capitalise, Anthony Mundine turning from Saint to Sinner as another opportunity went begging. Chance after chance going astray, missed opportunities the Reds made St George pay dearly for. The locals ahead 6-0 until right on half time Nathan Brown pulled something special from his bag of tricks. The Reds 6-4 at the break. A nervous Peter Mulholland soon given more to worry about. A beautifully taken by Gulfthorpe and Gulfthorpe will score. St George looked in control. Two tries stretching their lead to 22-6. Win, win will score. Try to the Dragons. The Reds weren't finished. Hitting back first through Julian O'Neill, then keeping the ball alive to move to within six points. It comes back now to Chris Ryan. Ryan going for the line. Throws the pass back on the inside. Manny Fuller picks it up and Manny Fuller scores his second try. But it was too late. St George securing a final spot, downing the Reds 22 to 16. The Dragons had gathered some momentum with their last round win and finished the regular season in seventh place. The returns of Scott Goulet and Jason Stevens were big ins for the Red V as the jostling for spots continued. Captain Mark Coyne also took his place for the quarterfinal matchup against Canberra at the SFS. The Dragons were blessed with depth as players such as Jim Lenahan, Nick Zisti, Kevin Campion and Troy Stone missed out and played in the Dragons reserve grade semi-final against the South Queensland Crushers. In an almighty battle that went right down to the wire, the Dragons and Raiders went end-to-end -end in an absorbing and gripping quarter-final that left both fans on the edge of their seats. And now the St George Dragons. This great club, they've played in over 100 finals matches in their history, and they start today as underdogs. And they have made a change to their starting lineup selected on Tuesday night. You can see the 16 there, Jeff Hardy, is in for Nathan Brown. That's their side, Raper, Walford, Coyne the captain, Bell, Brunker, Mundine, Goldthorpe, Bartram, Goulet, Barnhill, Felsch, Hardy and Stevens, David Waite, the St George coach and very much a contender for coach of the year. Kelvin Jeffs, the man in charge. David Manson was the referee in last night's match. And Wayne Bartram it will be to get us underway. Goldthorpe through Wayne Ball, it's Bartram, over halfway, getting across his Nagus. And Bartram gets inside the 20 and has lost the football. It has gone over the sideline, but the long ball from Goldthorpe. Now the touch judge is in. Well, by no means an easy kick for the first one for the day. It is 27 metres out. It is 10 metres in from touch. Three minutes gone. Wayne Bartram looking for first points. Here it goes in flight. It looks pretty good from Bartram. First points to the Dragons. The fans love it. They lead by two points to nil. And again, St George have conceded the penalty. This one is almost in front of the posts. I think the fact that Kelvin Jeffs has walked over towards the post means that they will take the kick at goal. A tally for Ferner of 138 points. He's ninth on the list of point scorers. Ferner, the first kick. He struck that just as well as Bartram. We're all locked up at two all. Six minutes gone at the Sydney Football Stadium. Goldthorpe away for Mundine. Mundine, good ball for Stevens. Stevens, where's the support? It's in the shape of Walford. Ten metres out from the Raiders' line. Walford had to stop to catch the ball. Now Coyne. It comes for Mundine. He stands, he steps. Mundine around the corner. Play on for the Dragons. Five metres out. Canberra, all hands on deck with Barnhill. Tries to steamroll his way through. Last tackle. Now the Dragons, Hardy back for Mundine. He grubbers. It's to the end goal. And Canberra get there. 
and now the chaser was all offside because Mundine was behind. Bartram from dummy half, away from Stone, Wayne Bartram, around Vegas, then around Collins, Bartram will score! That is a sensational solo tie, doesn't get any better, Wayne Bartram. Well we mentioned early on that he had a great season but you just can't believe what he has done in this one movement all on his own, out of dummy half. Puts the step on, Stone falls off, straight around Steve Wallace, big holes in the defence, Nagus grabs, another miss there, and good speed shown to outspeed David Boyle to score one of the best individual tries we have seen all year. It's all Wayne Bartram at the moment, a chance to score eight individual points, and it, he's done so. From 15 in from touch, Wayne Bartram having a superb day. 8-2, the Dragons over the Raiders. Daly away with Fernand. Ferner, almost around the inside, back for Mullins. He scores for Canberra. What a ball from Ferner. And Mullins posts the Canberra Raiders' first try. And in the last couple of minutes, St George have been their own worst enemy, coming up with mistakes in their own 30 or 40 metres. You can't give this football team possession for too long in your own danger area, because they will score. David Ferner almost did it himself. A magnificent ball back in. To Brett Mullins who dives across. He's had few touches of the football in this game so far. One of his early touches is a timely one. But David Ferner, he does it all. Throws the dummy. Both St George defenders couldn't wrap the football up. And that's a pretty good take for Mullins to go through the rape attack. Nine in from touch. 20 metres out. Ferner to level up. And the kickers are on song. David Ferner from wide out. It's eight all. The Raiders and the Dragons. Barnhill up to halfway. And still standing there, Barnhill, back there for Mundine. Mundine gets the stepping. Mundine over the 30. Stepping inside, he's able to offload. No, he loses it at the end when he was trying to pass. Mullins, the Canberra hero. Well, the word is that Mark Coyne pulled a, a Canberra support player out of the action and has been penalised. And that is the halftime siren you hear. So Laurie Daly has us underway for the second half. Standing. He's been able to offload a few times in this match. They're 25 metres out from the Dragons line. Stone pushes along. There's trouble here. It's more than trouble. Canberra over. Collins has scored for the Raiders. Now Jeffs consulted with Ingold Judge and then awards the try. But they caught the Dragons short. That's exactly what they did. And it was a very good option taken by Canberra. They got the penalty. That gave them some more possession. Free play there, you can see that the pass across to the receiver put Steve Collins in open space. No cover defence coming across until it was too late. Eight points is the tally for the day for Wayne Bartram. And now ten points, and that is the tally of St George. So it's a four-point ball game. We'll take a break. The Raiders 14, the Dragons 10. That is still a real chance. Brown is gone. It goes for Mundine from dummy half. Now for Collins! Yeah, what about that? Is the mouse trap legal? I would have thought that the, the attacking side have got out their, their players back. They've got two dummy halves on this occasion. I don't want to put cold water on the try because it's a well-worked move. He's got no right to be there. And Beautiful. use the referee very, very well. And Mundine, he attracted two defenders. Bruce Bermando, who's been caught out wide for quite a while for Canberra, trying to come up with the tackle. It is the mousetrap play for the game. Here's it, Lavico. Mundine gliding across the field. He takes on DeVico. Getting on the outside of DeVico, and that forced Brett Mullins to come in. Beautiful work from Coyne. Catches and passes with the attention of Nandruku. And Mark Bell, a prolific try scorer for whatever club he's playing at, gets the try. Wayne Bartram, he's hit the ball sweetly today. They won't get any tougher than this. On the wrong side also for a right foot kicker. 21 out. Bartram is swinging. Here it is with DeVico. DeVico now to the 20. Canberra 
look for Daly. He's to the left side of the ruck. Waters advances another 10. They're now eight metres out from the line. They've done a little more than hit it up. St George, can they absorb the pressure? Inside they try. 20 seconds. Phelps came over the top with Dean Raper. They're all in the front line. Daly kicks. It's the last throw of the dice and Bell is better than dead in goal. We'll never get a more important touch of the football in his career, Mark Bell. He scored the winning try for St George and he saved it at the other end. It's all over. The countdown has started. The siren will sound and Canberra are out. St George has survived the first week of the finals. The red and white army almost in disbelief. And Tim Sheens, we should reflect, his last match as coach for Canberra. St George have got up by two. Mark Bell supplied the match winning try. The goal to Bartram from the sideline. And they are through to live another day. No one could quite believe it. St George in the second week of the finals? How? Saints had won its ninth game in its last 10 matches. Much like most of the regular season where the critics had written them off, St George had defied the odds and found that red and white spirit to pull a game out of the fire. Against Canberra, it was Mark Bell finishing off the infamous mousetrap move to get the Dragons the win. Here, Bell chats about how the move unfolded from his point of view. We got a penalty, you know? we got a penalty right in front of the post. And after for watching the game, I think Phil Gould actually said, Now, there's two ten minutes to go, take your time, go for the take the two points, and that would have put us, I think, two points behind. And then we tapped the ball, and I think Phil said something like, Oh, well, good luck, basically. Tony had spoken to Anthony and Nathan, so they knew what was going on because Nathan, he loves to play a trick. And so he said to me, he said, just stay in the sideline. He said, I'll give you the ball. Um, they had obviously done the mousetrap. Coyne had beat his man. Then the winger, I think it was Noah, named Victor, he rushed in on Coyne. And Coyne basically had to do his catch and pass to me. And then I, um, I scored. Oh, it was fantastic, Yeah, you know, it was fantastic. Not because, you know, we, it had been over camera. It was fantastic because, you know, we'd given ourselves a shot to stay alive. And then um, Wayne had kicked the ball, kicked the goal from the sideline. Happy days. Yeah. You know, and then, you know, it was toing and thonging, defending for about, I don't know, seven minutes or so. So basically it was four sets of six we had to defend pretty well much. Anyway, we walked off the field, and this is how smart David Wade is. He said, you could have nearly got us the game because I had the ball in the wrong hand. The significance of the win against the Canberra Raiders in the quarterfinal cannot be understated. Anthony Mundine, the Dragons' star 5'8", again had a hand in everything, and he gave his thoughts on the win and just how strong those Canberra sides of the 1990s were, as well as his great battles with another star 5'8", his nemesis, Laurie Daly. We had, um, we had Canberra for the stuff, and they were, they were a team full of internationals, and they're Kiwi and Australian internationals. And um, you know, for some reason, we always you know, went up against the wall and always so look at the better rooms. Um, throughout the, the mid nineties and um and uh yeah so it was a massive game and you know, like I said we, we had that belief we had to we run out about eleven out of twelve in the last coming into the finals. And that was our first finals game and we believed we just believed in ourselves and you know, it doesn't matter if simple international was one of the best I mean my 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 adversary our day um you know, uh, Ponya, may he rest in peace. They had, they had, they had a, a mm. beast in the same age. No one named Drew Q. I mean, they had, they had this as our skin team, but we had belief in ourselves. Of, in the, I remember in dressing rooms, we just chump. You know, got together a lot around and got close together in a huddle and we tell each other, we don't know what happens, but we just might come back in these sheds. Um, not knowing that we, we gave it all, gave it our all. 
and that was our attitude. And, um, you know, we had certain, you know, had myself, um, sort of, um, you know, played off and great games, you know, at any time. So, yeah, Wayne Bartram was another one that, that, um, was a very explosive and strong and quick and scored a great individual try in that game. I remember that, that try. And, um, you know, we went on to win it, which is great. Who would be the one to stand up to be counted for in the clash against Sydney City in the semi final in week two of the playoffs? The Roosters had been the benchmark for a large majority of 1996. However, a combination of injuries, poor form, and sides firing up against the Tricolours had seen it fall away in the back half of the season. Saints had already played them once this year, a 24 points to 8 win at Cogra that had stopped a five game slide for the Red V. However, that was a Roosters side missing stars Brad Fittler, Adrian Lamb and Matt Singh. They were back and no doubt had revenge firmly on their minds as well as being desperate to keep their season alive. The Roosters had come close to knocking over a brilliant Manly side a week prior, but now had destiny in their own hands. Win or go home. With a master tactician in Phil Gould pulling the strings behind the scenes, the Dragons would have to be at the absolute best and then some to knock out the Tricolours. The Dragons also had a secret weapon, Anthony Mundine's mouth. The brash-talking, young, exciting 5'8 was brilliant on the field, but off the field, he did his best to get under the skins of his rivals. He'd done it to Laurie Daly in week one of the finals and was trying to do it to another one of his nemesis, Brad Fittler in the second week elimination final against Sydney City. Here, Mundine talks about the impact that his words could have on players and settling them on the field, even if they looked composed off it. You know, I would come out with statements like, well, I picked him, I whipped him, and stuff like that. And, you know, this really used to get under the, the skin, obviously. They wouldn't, sh- wouldn't show, show it, you know, publicly, but when we go on the field, you know, I could show by the body language and the way they were revved up and charged up and try and charge their players up. But I knew what got under their skin. And it was like, it was like a, it was like a fight. Now, now that I'm in the Boston game, it was like, it was like a fight. It was like yeah. a title fight. And, and, um, but I would love that. I, I'd thrive under pressure with that. You know what I mean? Um, so taking on the Bruce's, another star started, star started outfit. Um, you know, had a lot of money behind him and whatnot. Um, you know, but Fitler, he was my my nemesis and, you know, someone that I wanted to to not just beat but continue continually beat. And, you know, I put it in my mind that, you know, I wanted to get my boys on the same level I, I was. The Dragons' confidence was sky high though. From the training paddock to the field on match day, the squad felt they could win every game that they played in. Like we had a lot of confidence then by that time. So it just seemed like we ran onto the field knowing that we were going to win. Mm. Like the confidence was real high in the camp and our training was all fun and boys are laughing, joking, mucking around. But our, our sessions when we done our ball work and stuff were real sharp. So you know as a player, when, when you're real sharp at your last couple of sessions, then you're feeling good and you think, yeah, we're going to play good. Mm. So you just know as a player, like how your team's travelling and the confidence is sky high, the talk's good. When everyone's talking, you know, your team, uh, you, they're confident, so you can feel comfortable with it all. Kicking was the name of the game at the SFS on a sun-soaked Sunday afternoon. With close to 38,000 in attendance, could St George keep its dream season alive? St George. One of the celebrated clubs. Got away to a shocking start. The players going every which way. They basically didn't have a coach. And here they are. The action. Manson's the referee. Bartram starts. To the air. Not a bad kick. Oh, he had it. He lost it. It's a try. It's a try scored by Darren Judy. Goldthorpe with a power, wide, kicking, looking for Frank Gard, up they go, down they come, it's a 
another try! The number five, Adrian Branca! Well, the wing is having a field day. Adrian Branca, he obviously sat at home last night and watched Richard Barnett do exactly the same thing in exactly the same corner for the Sharks. A beautiful kick. They get nice and deep in attack, St George. And Noel Goldthorpe, precision. Over the head of Darren Tunit, the leap was a great one from Adrian Brunk. He's their leading try scorer this year, and that is why. Brown. Behind Thompson, then for Campy, and now for Mundine. Mundine, lots of over the top. It's play on for Bell. Bell takes ahead. St George are leading the race. St George are going to score. It's Mark Coyne. Mark Coyne has scored. And it's another try from a kick. It's a kickathon here at the SFS today. Goldthorpe running the ball, then passing behind Bell. Bell puts a kick in. He leads the race again. Puts it on the boot. Goldthorpe had it and lost it. It's play on. Mundine. Mundine has scored. This is incredible. Well, Mark Bell has got it on a string. He got a poor pass on the last tackle. Got the kick in. I'd just like to have a look where a couple of his support players were in relation to where he kicked the football. But Noel Goldthorpe decides to run it on the last. Goes behind Mark Bell. Keeps control of it. Slides it in behind Jorgensen beautifully. Comes through. Now, have a look on the inside as to whether Noel Goldthorpe is offside or not. Goldthorpe definitely kicked the football back, though he didn't mean to, and Mundine keeps his head. I just wonder where Noel Goldthorpe was in relation to Mark Bell when he kicked. Well, oh, they're not hot, they're smoking. Oh, Mundine gets it on the coin. And oh. Brunka, Brunka gets his second. St. George. They're not smoking, they're on fire. Four to two to four. It is a bushfire out of control here. Nothing going right for the Roosters. And the wingers are having real problems this afternoon. They've given Jorgensen and Juno plenty of reps this year and they've deserved it. But this afternoon, it's been their opposite players who are enjoying the spoils. And Adrian Brunker, he gets another one. Bell's got two. All the backs lining up. It's novelty day. Brunker, two tries. And this is well done from Mark Coyne. Going across the field. And then Brunker lines himself up. He starts on one angle comes back on the other and that forces the gap the defence heading one way then Brunker comes back on the inside no one there and he's a former State of Origin player it was a while ago but it's the try line Chance here for Sydney City Metzing and it's a try alright probably had to be a penalty if he didn't score it anyway finished it off nicely. Well, it's one of the best tries we've seen over the two weekends, isn't it? This was the the restart from the, the line dropout. It was very quick thinking from the Roosters with Adrian Lamb racing forward and recapturing the ball. Peter Clark made the big bust and then he got the dummy half to find Julian Troy onto Sean Garlic. Committed two defenders. Ball eventually onto Walker and this is a great ball from Tony Iroh. He attracted a couple as well and Adrian Lamb who started the play finishes it 90 metres downfield. St George who just ran out of troops here, they'd all covered. They just didn't have the numbers to control this movement from the Roosters. So from close range, the kick was successful. 36 points to 16. Saints had gone bang bang and knocked out two giants of the 1996 Optus Cup. Momentum 
confidence, happiness, and pride were swelling around the St. George region as well as in the Dragons dressing room. The win against Sydney City and the manner in which it was done was turning heads. Saints weren't just the Anthony Mundine show anymore. No doubt he was a superb player and St. George needed him at his absolute best if they were to win the whole thing. But the win against the Roosters showed the versatility of the Red V. Noel Goldthorpe had sent towering bombs all afternoon at the Sydney City wingers and as a result, Adrian Brunker and Mark Bell had field days. Goldthorpe had quite the afternoon and even had a few words of advice for Roosters captain Brad Fittler who'd had a running battle with all afternoon. Pretty um, early in the game, he... Um... They, uh, yeah, they sort of try, and I remember him running past and patting me on the head, you know, which really, oh, I thought, oh, <laughs> I didn't like it. <laughs> but, um, you know, that was early in the game, so he had his tail up, and he thought, you know, they were going well, and then uh, sort of we put them, put them to the sword in the second half and really blew them away. So, yeah, it was very rewarding for me. <laughs> that he, he was patting me on the head at the start, and I, I think I asked him at the end of the game, he, I said, you haven't got much to say now. The forwards were laying the platform again, as well as creating second-phase play via their offloads. Wayne Bartram led the way and was followed by the young Lance Thompson and the durable Luke Felsch at prop. Then you had the dynamic Dean Raper at the back, who was a constant threat returning the football. Saints were anything but one-dimensional. It seemed that sections of the media were still waiting for Saints to eventually fall over, though. The forthcoming match against a red-hot North Sydney side was surely when it would happen, wouldn't it? Given no chance against Canberra, the Dragons are showing the resolve and spirit that has seen the club win 11 premierships in a row in the 1950s and 60s. Little thought was handed to St George the next week against a star of Sydney City, but once again, much like the most of the 1996 season, St George had proved the doubters wrong. It was time for them to do it again. Norse had the wood on St George and were warm favourites heading into the preliminary final at the SFS on a warm Sunday afternoon. They had won four of the last five meetings against the Dragons, dating back to 1993, including the only meeting between the pair in 1996. The Bears had trampled Saints 42-0 at North Sydney Oval back in Round 7. It was arguably the lowest ebb of the year for the Dragons, and despite losing three more games after this, that loss was the nucleus for change. The Bears were stacked all over the park and it was evident that St George would have to shut down so many of their difference makers to even have a shot at staying in the ball game. The Shawman had pace all over the back line. Matt Sears was at fullback, the best finisher in the game Brett Dallas on one wing and the sharp shooting Jason Taylor at halfback. There wasn't much reprieve when you moved into the forwards. New South Wales representatives Greg Florimo at lock, David Fairley in the second row, and the hard-nosed Queenslander Billy Moore playing on the edge of the ruck. Despite this, there was an air of invincibility about St George. The fans could feel it, and you're damn sure the players could feel it. With Coach of the Year candidate David Waite conjuring up everything in his power to keep Saints alive in 1996, this game promised to be a cracker. St George go out behind Mark Coyne. And the St George Army, the Red and White Army, they are in evidence. Magnificent winners last weekend. Not many gave them a chance. But not only did they win, they won decisively. Raper Zisti, Coin, Bell, Brunker, Mundine, Goldthorpe, Bartram, Goulet, Campion, Runs On, Felch, Hardy, Stone, David Wade as the coach. 100 games of first grade coaching today. Sears on, Butner away. Nigel Roy is with it on the 20 metre line, away from Brunker. Able to get a pass away, though he had two players on him. Butner then for Fairley. Fairley back around for Butner. Then for Taylor. Surely. Oh! Intercepted by Mark Bell! Scored two last weekend! Is he going to have the pace? He's inside the 20. Now he's pulled down. Coyne gets under a high tackle from Larson. Able to get it away. Hardy turns it back. Now it's with Mundine. Goldthorpe. Goldthorpe pulled down inches from the line. Thought about the double movement. Now Mundine. Floats it out. They'll score. Raper. Raper is in. Hold it. He hasn't pointed to the mark. Now he has. Dean Raper has scored for St. John. Likes to get out and run, this is their last. And a shot for drop goal from Goldthorpe. Did it get a touch? No, it didn't get a touch and the arm goes up. 
One point for St George. Seven points to nil after 23 minutes. Not given the North Sydney half any piece at all. Brown puts him down after Taylor gets a kick in, but it goes... Oh! Nigel Roy peels out of a tackle. Centre kick. Saints don't clean it up. The Bears win. Sears. Matt Sears scores. Five minutes from the break. He's gone and Taylor raises the flags. He becomes the second highest point scorer for the Bears. And we go to the break. St George by one. Raper got the try. It was converted by Bartram. Goldthorpe added a field goal. Then North Sydney with Matt Sears scoring the try. Taylor with a penalty. And 7 6 at the break. Now Mundine. Mundine. Are they going to get him? No, I don't think so. Mundine's over. St. George. Now they lead by five. And that's what this kid can do, Anthony Mundine. Put him in space and he's just got that many gears. Plenty of jubilation because they know how important this one could be. It's really come from nothing. Or Sydney hadn't formed that well after being broken the previous play. And then up the middle, Mundine. David Hall is no slouch, but he was never going to get Anthony Mundine. Neither was Nigel Roy. Bartram with a relatively simple kick. There's the extras. 13 to 6. Gold four. They're all on side. There's no drama. And they beat out Jumpton Bell. Gets it away and Bartram scores. Will they extend? I'll tell a man they will. Uh, beautiful work again from St George. Game slipping away from North Sydney now. And Wayne Bartram, another nail in the coffin here. Yeah. So another converted try, 19 to 6. Mundine shut it. Soden! Soden's over! Mark Soden has put it over the line. Right under the black dot. That's exactly what was needed. There's still 20 minutes to go in this match. Plenty of time to score the necessary points. A nine point lead. Be free play there. You can see that St George player, the marker, was slow to get in position. Soden uses him as a shield, and there's a hole in behind the ruck for him to exploit. 10 metre line. Brown. Brown will score! Nathan Brown has scored, and probably clinched it for St George. Yeah, no doubt about that. Nathan Brown, a lot of space there. The hooker got one at the other end for... The North Sydney not that long ago, now Nathan Brown. Grand final is 45 seconds away. And uh, North Sydney fly above the pack, but they lose it. Mark Bell's looking for the corner, and he gets it down. Well, Mark Bell. What a final series he's having. He is indeed getting plenty of tries, got two last week. Another one today. And from the kick once again where North Sydney, they flew high. Noel Goldthorpe, who kicked the football, was able to fly onto it. Coming down about 15 metres out. Out of the North Sydney player's hand. And there was Goldthorpe covering up his kick. The good ball out in front of Mark Bell and Brett Dallas. He got the tackle, but the line was too close. One thing about Bell, he can find this try line. And the kick, how important is the kick been in semi-finals in 1996? Yet another try from a kick. Goldthorpe's had them on a string today. And ring-a-ding-ding, -ding, here comes the Bell man. So Wayne Bartram fails to convert. The game is over. With St George winning 29-12. Raper, Brown, Mundine, Bartram and Bell scored the five tries. Bartram kicked four from five. Goldthorpe kicked a field goal. And for the Bears, Sears and Soden got the tries. Taylor kicked two from three. But with this mixture of youth, enthusiasm and experience, 
they're not going to be easily denied. 13 outings and they've lost one in the run through to the grand final. As the Dragons go to their very big fan club, there is no greater club in rugby league than St George. They won 11 premierships back to back. Their last was in 79. Can they win it in 96? I thought uh, before the game, one side would break at some stage in the second half because of the pressures that both sides will be, be able to apply. Which side it was, uh, I wasn't 100% sure. But I knew we'd prepared well and I'd, I'd hoped desperately that we, we, we would come away with it. And we did. Oh, it's just that we've really dug ourselves out of the gutter, I think, that's all. And you know, as each week's gone on, we've improved on the David and, and uh, we've got more confident every every game we've played in the semis and to the point now where, you know, we've just got that much enthusiasm and uh, spirit that's it's just unbelievable. St. George! St. George! St. George! St. fans can feel it. Their side is on a roll. Just one loss in their last 13 starts sees them into the grand final. They're convinced the great club is set for Premiership number 16. I thought it was great. Everyone always writes us off, but you always come through. They're just awesome. They're the best. We're going to do it this year. Arriving back at the league's club tonight, the players were given a hero's welcome. Yeah, I'm happy to be playing here. Either way, I would have been happy no matter where I played, but it's great to be back there. All the guys are great blokes, and we're in the grand final, so yeah, nothing could be better. To see so many supporters out there today and rearing us on, they had a big part of us um, winning today. Inside, the chance continued. The great red and white machine is back. Their last premiership win, 1979. It's a great effort for what St George have done this year. The way it all started, they didn't nearly didn't have a team this year. And look at it now, unbelievable, mate. We'll win the grand final. We had a coach at the beginning, and now they've done really fantastic. I'm really proud of them. Several players are leaving the club at the end of the season, and that's plenty of motivation. Yeah, that's probably one of the main reasons because um, all the boys are, you know, a few of the boys are leaving, and you know, we really want to do it together. The toughest part now for the fans, apart from the game, is camping outside the league's club until Monday. Anthony Mundine had again been the man for the Dragons. His runaway 60-metre try, midway through the second half, had broken open the game when the score was 7-6 to St George and precariously poised. He'd also set up the first try for Dean Raper, and here he talks about his memories of that 1996 preliminary final and the ecstasy it was guiding St George to another grand final. They were, they were challenged to, to play definitely make the, the final and if not win it. Um they, they, they had, I think they, they had the break. Um they finished in top four and they won the game the the, the semi and had a break and just come into the the major semi with us. So that was the that was the favourite at the time. But we just come out and you know with that belief and with that attitude that we, we could take out anybody and no matter how good they were or how how many the players they had, we wasn't intimidated at all. And um you know, we got off to a, a great start. Um with um I think uh, a right ball scoring in the corner, mm -hmm. a mark ball score intercept and um run with it the length and got caught just through the line and then uh, I was up in the dummy out and pulled over the top to a uh, long pass over the top. Hit the paper and we scored. And from there, it was just, you know, we always seen that could hold the game. In one of the finest performances in recent St George history, the Dragons had toppled another Premiership heavyweight to qualify for the 1996 Grand Final. Saints had hit a rich vein of form at the right time of the season, and its performance against North was their best of the season. Anthony Mundine stole the highlight with a 60 metre runaway try that tore the game away from the Bears when the score was 7-6 to St George. Wayne Bartram was again a standout at lock, Nathan Brown was his darting best in the hooker roll and the Dragons forwards rolled over, demoralised Bears outfit in the second half as they wilted in the springtime heat. It was heartache for the Bears but jubilation for the Dragons. The celebrations ran well into the night as players and fans mingled and reminisced about one of the finest performances of the 1996 season. Remarkable, wasn't it? 
the St George Dragons, one of the proudest and most successful rugby league clubs not just in Australia, in the world, was again heading for the grand final. How they made it is a testament to the superb ability and resilience of the coaching staff, players and front office of the club that all contributed to what was happening on the field. From the ruins of the Super League war with no players, no coach and seemingly no future, St George were back. As the celebrations faded away and grand final week began, the Dragons had to knuckle down and focus on the job at hand. The ominous task of beating the best side in the competition, the Manly Warringah Seagulls. Manly had been the benchmark in 1996, much like they had in 1995, where they crumbled in the decider against Canterbury. There were similarities to what had unfolded in 1996 and what happened in the 1995 season. Canterbury had also battled insular turmoil and made a miraculous end-of-season run to take out the Premiership. They had in fact beaten St George in the first semi-final on their way to the Crown. It didn't seem like Manly would let this happen again, and they were very much on guard to that and St George being branded as underdogs. Favouritism would go to Manly, and rightfully so. They had pulled off a fantastic defensive year, conceding on average just 8 points per game. Their attack, led by Jeff Tuvey and Cliff Lyons, had blissed oppositions throughout the season. There was just as much potency in its attack as there was with their hard-nosed and physical defence. The sides had already met once during the season, with Manly triumphing 6-2 on a wet and cold night at Cogra. Unfortunately, when it came to the grand final day, it just didn't come together for the Dragons. There had been rain in the lead-up to the game, and the greasy track didn't suit the Dragons' style of play, as centre Mark Bell explains. When you have players like Anthony Mundurin, who are quick on their feet, you know, Dean Roper was very, very agile. Wayne Barton was very good on his feet. He needed it to be, we needed it to be a dry track. We didn't want, and again, and that's what cost us a little bit in, in 95 in the semi-final against Canada, we didn't want it to be a wet track. We wanted it to be hot, and we wanted it to be, you know, um, a real good, firm, dry track so we could run. Um, but again, that's what we can't control. And you know, again, Manly were the best side the whole season. Mm. The contentious decision that led to Matthew Ridge not being tackled when it appeared that he was held by Nathan Brown, led to a try right on the halftime siren and gave Manly a formidable 14 points to two halftime lead. From there, Saints couldn't recover and Manly held firm for a 20 points to eight win. Although disappointed at falling at the final hurdle, there was an air of accomplishment and achievement from the playing group. Having taken the side so far during the 1996 season, against all the odds, Saints had gained an awful amount of respect from all corners of the rugby league community. The fact that fans still talk about this legendary season today shows the lasting impact it has had on fans. Mark Bell summed it up best when chatting about the 1996 season as a whole. And no one ever gave us an opportunity. No one ever gave us a chance. No one. The best football judges didn't give us a chance. It was an achievement that no one would ever thought that we were going to do. Yeah, and yeah, you know, and I still think that we saved St George that day. That completes part three of the St George Dragons 1996 documentary. What a phenomenal season it was! A side that had ten players at pre-season training and was at some stages on the verge of collapse, making it all the way to the decider against the more fancied Manuringa Seagulls. We here at the Red V Podcast want to thank all the players involved with the documentary for their tireless work in our interviews, recapping what was a phenomenal season. A huge thanks to Jeff Hardy, Noel Goldthorpe, Mark Bell, Scott Goulet, Kevin Campion, Mark Coyne and David Waite. We would like to thank Jubilee Avenue for their phenomenal website detailing many years of St. George Dragons and Illawarra Steelers history, particularly helping us with the 1996 season, as well as the RL Stats website detailing every match, points, tries and goals scored from 1908 until the current day that was phenomenally helpful in the pursuit of the St. George Dragons 1996 season. 
We hope you've enjoyed this 1996 St. George Dragons documentary, and there'll be plenty more documentaries here on the Red V Podcast. If you have any suggestions or any feedback about the episodes that you listen to, please do get in contact with us via our email, redvpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you.